Welcome to Beat Around the Barn. Will eating plants really save our planet? We asked this very question to a Canadian vegan, Michael Farley, who teaches environmental studies. And after we dove into that, we also had a very engaging round table discussion. Please do join us and we'd love to hear what you think as well. Hi, Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. It's so great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us on Beat Around the Barn. Uh, usually we like to start off by asking everyone to just introduce yourself and what you do and so forth. And if you can uh, throw in there your going vegan story um, sure. and maybe also too whether or not or how it relates to going vegan as an environmentalist or for the environment. Yeah, sure. So uh, I live in Toronto, Canada with my wife and my little doggy. Um, I have been teaching middle and high school uh, geography and environmental studies for about 20 years now. Um, and, and a big part of that has included uh, looking at things like climate change and looking at agriculture. Um, and my kind of wake up was it, really in the 90s, I became vegetarian when I started to learn about um, the environmental impact of, of uh, animal agriculture. And I was mainly vegetarian up until a few years ago um, when we, uh, we adopted our little dog. And uh, I hadn't really thought too much about the animal aspect um, of, of going vegan or vegetarian, but there was something about learning about her history. She had been um, in a puppy mill and had been kept in a cage for a number of years. And we kind of learned more about her background and something just kind of a switch went off for both my wife and I. We, we realized um, that we were devastated to learn about our, our dog's history. And yet, you know, there was uh, what was going on in terms of, you know, pigs, cows, chickens was very similar. And so for, for both of us, something literally switched overnight where we decided to go vegan, you know, um, give up dairy. And so this whole other um, facet to uh, going vegan entered in the picture it wasn't solely just the environmental aspect but then it was also really considering you know the animal sentience piece too so that was a few years ago and then um i have been really kind of digging deep and trying to learn more and more about um incorporating animal issues um, plant-based issues into my teaching uh you know the ways of doing that in in that are accessible and equitable um, and hopefully can can influence in terms of you know, knowledge, attitude, behaviors amongst my my classes and my school community. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because so you were saying you've been teaching um, uh, geography, environmental studies for about twenty years or so, and I think you were also awarded right by the the Royal Ge Geographical Society as well. So congrats on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was a, a, yeah. a great, uh, a great honor. And, and they, they were really looking at innovation. And, and so there's a number of things, but including kind of starting to lean into issues that normally aren't spoken about necessarily in terms of environmental issues in the classroom. And so bringing in some of these outlier issues and trying to make them a little more accessible. So I, I think it was also, you know, it, I, you know, obviously I was honored by that, but it was also um, an endorsement or a testament to um, being able to talk about difficult topics like, you know, veganism, mm -hmm. plant-based uh, foods, uh, animal exploitation, et cetera. Yeah, and then is this what now had you start this Educator for Animals conference? Because you've now just recently started that, correct? Yeah, so uh, two years ago, I started my um, master's of education in humane education through the Institute of Humane Education uh, in Maine. And um, through that, I, I really started to, to, you know, push myself to, you know, what impact would I have outside of my own classes, outside of my own school community? I really, you know, I had to kind of take a step up and put myself out there a bit. And so I had this idea to run a conference Originally, it was just going to be for Canadian educators who were interested in some way, shape, or form, or were already incorporating animal issues into their classes. Um, and so I started that um, almost a year ago, kind of looking into it. I was reaching out to educators in Canada, and things really snowballed. 
Um, and then it became, there was so much interest even globally. Um, and then a sponsor came in and sponsored the whole conference to make it free. So in the end, we had uh, over 600 registrations from educators around the world, a lot from Canada and the US, but also Asia, uh, South America, uh, Australia, um, Africa, you name it. Um, we had uh, four amazing keynote speakers, including Luis Hoyos, who's the Academy Award winning uh, director of The Cove and um, the Racing Extinction and the Game Changers. Um, but we also had uh, 18 sessions uh, with over 50 speakers involved and panels. So it was, uh, it was uh, started as a small idea about a year ago. And I just, <laughs> I just realized that there was a real vacuum and a real um, thirst for educators to come together and have some sense of community to be able to talk about animal protection issues um, in an educational environment. So um, yeah, yeah, it was great. I have a question for you, yeah. Mike. What about, do you get any pushback or is that something that you cover with the people in your, in your conferences from the school systems and how, how do you handle that? It's a great question. It's probably the most asked question, I think. And it, <laughs> I think, it, you know, it, you really, as an educator, you have to understand the environment that you're teaching in. You have to understand your classes, your parent community, your, your administration. And so you have to you have to kind of gauge that and and you know with anything that you're teaching, but especially about delicate topics. So um, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, the school I teach in is very uh, progressive, and the administration is very supportive of trying different things. Um, but you know, different uh, educators have to kind of be deft, and and you have to uh, uh, be um, cognizant of where people are coming from. You know, for example, if you're teaching in a more of a rural community, I'm in a very urban community. So, you know, there's issues around that you'd have to take into consideration. And it has to be done, I think really with a spirit of kindness and openness. And I've really been um, trying to talk to educators. And, and this was, I think a flavor of the conference amongst the speakers was more about exploration and more about um, starting with just questioning our relationship to animals as a starting point. And then just to see where things go. It's not so much about, you know, going in and saying everybody has to become vegan. You know, this is the only way to do it, um, which really that doesn't really work with teaching anyways, whatever you're talking, talking about. So um, I think a lot of educators have had success with just keeping it very spacious, keeping it very open and kind of making the inquiry. It's like, what, what is our relationship to animals, which I think we've become so disconnected from in the first place. Um, yeah. And so that a lot of times just starts to, to trigger things in a good way. It's like, oh, you, you start to question about where is our food coming from? What impact is that having on the environment? What impact is that having on other human beings? What impact is that having on marginalized communities? So mm -hmm. um, that I think is, is a maybe a general rule of thumb, but then it's going to have to be you know, fine-tuned and, and personalized depending on what situation you're in. You know, you're talking about this being disconnected, right? And I think in many ways, a lot of people compartmentalize, right? Because yeah. I can see already people who might be watching this going, well, okay, but what do the animals have to do with the environment? Like, right. where's the connection here, right? Can you talk a bit about that, you know, and really kind of start from ground one, right? Or ground zero to, to help people really understand why are we talking about animals and compassionate animal when we're talking about the environment? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, you know, study after study after study has shown that um, kind of large scale animal agriculture is one of the leading causes, for example, of um, climate change, you know, in terms of the amount of inputs that have to go in, the amount of energy um, to really not get back that much you know, food sustenance relatively, the amount of energy that has to go in to produce relatively little return on that. Um, the, the, the release of methane um, from uh, various animals. Um, and so that um, has, a, has, a, has a massive, you know, impact, but also, you know, and I think these topics don't get enough airplays, you know, looking at deforestation, which is also connected you know, to climate change, but in terms of clearing out forest land in order to create grazing land 
you know, for cattle, for example. Um, and then you're removing, you know, carbon sinks, you're removing those trees that have the ability to uh, absorb carbon dioxide and, and transfer it into oxygen. Um, so there's all of these competing effects, but also you've got the water use, you've got water pollution that's related in there. So um, if you look at studies done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or um, Project Drawdown, which is another great resource, they're placing animal agriculture and us needing to really question and change the way that we do things in terms of our food systems as one of the top um, uh, solutions for not only climate change, but some of these other very important environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then yourself as a vegan and you right, are an environmentalist. I yeah. mean, if we eat plants, will that actually save our planet, save our planet, right? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think it's definitely going to help a lot. But it, it, again, if you look at what the science is showing us, and again, if you're looking at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or some of these, it is really is a very complex um, issue that's going to require, I think, some very, very large wholesale changes in many aspects of our lives, including, you know, our food systems. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, the way that we structure our families and population, in terms of, you know, transportation, the way that we get around, um, in terms of how we produce our energy and renewables. It, so I, I think definitely veganism and plant-based diets is, is going to be a large piece of that puzzle. But I do think that there are other aspects. And so um, sometimes it can get easy to say, well, you know, I'm, I have a vegan lifestyle or a vegan diet, plant-based diet, and that's kind of enough. You know, you can kind of, <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm recycling and that's enough, or I, you know, I've reduced my flying and that's enough. Um, but really, I think we have to take a step back and look at, you know, not only um, everything is being done at a policy level, at a business level, but also at a personal level um, that we really have to start thinking, well, what are the impacts of all of these and how do they kind of enmesh and interact with one another as well? Mm -hmm. What about those statistics? Like, I mean, yeah. there's just so much arguing, um, you know, yeah. like in social media and even with the documentaries yeah. and people mm -hmm. disproving, how do we know what's, what's actually right? Yeah, it, that's a great question. So uh, those those the two sources I mentioned, I think, are, are really Project Drawdown, um, very, very well vetted by uh, academics and research and the IPCC, which I mentioned uh, before those reports. Uh, but, um, you know, it's the, there was a very interesting study that came out. It was done by uh, Kimberly Wynn um, from Lund University in Sweden and Seth Wines from University of British Columbia. And they, this is looking at Canada, but I think this can probably be applied to a lot of uh, industrialized countries. They looked at um, kind of environmental education and, and, and climate change education in Canada. And they looked at the curriculum and textbooks and what was being taught in terms of what are solutions for climate change in our, in, and what was being relayed in our classrooms. And the vast majority, it was like 95% of the time it was looking at very, very low impact actions, you know, such as um, recycling, um, replacing your light bulbs, um, uh, air drying your clothes, you know, and listen, those are all good things, but, right, exactly. um, but if you start really looking at high impact personal actions, you know, um, a plant-based diet uh, is very high up there, reducing flying, flying is, is a, a huge use of, of energy, huge pollutant. Mm. Um, ideally, if you can, getting rid of your car or one of your cars or, or greatly reducing your driving. Um, and, then, and then also, you know, the issue of family size, so really considering how you structure your family, how many children, you know, you want to have or not have, or adopting or redefining your family in some way. So really trying to, to really, these are not isolated decisions. What we eat is not isolated from the environment. How we get around is not isolated from the environment. The choices we make about our families are not isolated from the environment. We are deeply interconnected. So, um, you know, that I think in terms of shifting as an educator, 
I'm working and there's a lot of other educators working to try and shift the narrative around as opposed to the laundry list of things I think that you know you're you're hitting on and it's like oh you just do these the reusable grocery bags and that you know <laughs> that's going to solve everything and and if you look at the numbers it's not it like it is a drop in the bucket it really is a drop in the bucket but on the other hand just to take any one thing on its own and say well that's enough that is probably not you know the right way to go either and also looking at larger policy changes in terms of you know a shift to renewable energy um, you know, a carbon taxes, things that can be done at a larger policy level, but also at a local or personal level are important. All of it, all of it needs to happen. It's not either or. So mm -hmm. I know you're talking about, um, especially in social media, it can be people can kind of get into their camps. You know, the the the, yeah. the people who the climate, the um, people who have given up flying camp versus the vegan camp versus the small families <laughs> camp versus. Uh, the climate change deniers, you know, it, it, everybody's kind of in their own corner, but really, um, I think it, it, it has to be a multifaceted approach overall. And, mm -hmm. and I just have to say on that too, is that everybody, everybody is going to have their own capabilities uh, to mm. do that. Yeah. And so that also mm -hmm. has to be taken into consideration. You know, for example, with plant-based foods, vegan lifestyle, that is not accessible equally to all uh, communities. You know, you have things mm. like food deserts where it's just very difficult for some communities to actually even access, you know, good uh, fruits and vegetables and be able to have a healthy um, plant-based diet. So, so it's, it, it has to be done with um, spaciousness. It has to be done um, in a way that acknowledges all of the other challenges that are, are different people have and privileges that people have. Um, and, and really to try and figure out where is your kind of edge point and to keep pushing that, pushing that as much as possible. And that's gonna look different for different people, for different communities different countries, um, it's going to look mm. very different, but a big change has to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, so for that big change to occur, then are you a fan of policy? You know, because obviously, you know, we're in the U.S. and I know this comment's going to come off very American, right? But, uh, you know, maybe is the catalyst actually people looking at the money-making angles of being able to change and paradigm shift, right? Because I just... I feel like if we have more companies who put themselves behind the efforts that right. will actually make things change, right? Then is that the bigger catalyst? And maybe we're just talking, because are we talking about sh you know shifting in a good reasonable amount of time to make an actual impact, right? We're not just talking about slow, right, over time. So anyway, that's kind of, I would love to hear, you, are you a fan of policy? Is the policy what pushes the, the money makers, you know, or, or, or how can we get that going, you know? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great question as well. What actually gets us all going <laughs> if we had an easy answer? Yeah, um, I think it is, you know, I don't think, I don't think like business is a, is a, is a dirty word in any way. I think, I think, I mean, I think part of it is, is being able to have the true cost of things really unveiled, you know, and, and a lot of the, the subsidies from, from government, for example, um, mm. or lack of laws or taxes that are propping up businesses okay. that, um, you know, now we're starting to see the effects of those hidden costs coming back in terms of things like wildfires and hurricanes and, and mm. in, you know, all of the expenses that are going into um, you know, trying to mitigate the effects of climate change. So what what would happen if we could actually take a step back and sort of, well, what are the true costs, for example, of animal mm -hmm. agriculture on, mm -hmm. on the environment, you know, on the environment, on other human beings, on animals? What are those true costs? And let's strip away some of the policies that are falsely propping those up and, and maybe put those towards, you know, more green businesses or businesses that are, are more plant mm -hmm. forward. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm definitely um, a fan of that, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in what's going on at the COP26 right now in terms of, you know, kind of global um, policies. And, and I know mm -hmm. um, there's some cynicism or a lot of cynicism about um, policy change and the ability for politicians to to enact change. But I think the fact that it, we're actually talking about, I'd rather have that conference happening than not you know the fact that it's yes. it's headline news you know in 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 many parts of the world and that mm -hmm. people are really kind of paying attention to it i think that's kind of 
creating a bit of a zeitgeist, a cultural zeitgeist in terms of, you know, pushing. But, but the I think the danger of, of um, as individuals of, of looking solely at policy as being the solution is that it, you can kind of wipe your hands a bit and say, well, I, and I do see these camps kind of emerging too. It's like the personal action versus large scale policy and mm -hmm. people kind of saying, well, it's either or in that way. Um, but I think actually it's both, you know, and, and, and these are very difficult changes, you know, for, you know, in Canada, for example, um, you know, there's a proposed pipelines and there's a phasing mm -hmm. out of, of coal mining that really affects, but those are very difficult decisions for policy policymakers to make that's affecting people's jobs. It's affecting people's livelihoods. It's affecting community and there's the right thing to do, but you know, if, if those difficult decisions are being made at a policy level, then I think it, it is upon us as well. Again, depending on what level of capability we have to do that, but is to um, push ourselves to make difficult decisions for ourselves, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that might mean, you know, changing our diet, you know, changing the way we get around, changing how we view family, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting, um, you know, to have this discussion with you because uh, what I'm hearing overwhelmingly is that we have to come together as a community, right, right to actually save our planet, so to speak, right, or at least obviously uh, improve the health of our planet, that it's going to take all of us, all the countries together uh, to, to pull it um, to pull it through. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. The more, the more we can kind of move away from, you know, the, this kind of idea of, of getting too locked into our, our position or stance, mm -hmm. remaining very mm -hmm. nimble. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've learned that the hard way because I've <laughs> definitely been one of those people in the past who's kind of gotten very um, stubborn and, and strong headed about certain <laughs> positions. And then mm -hmm. I found out a couple of years later that I was dead wrong on things. So, <laughs> being, you know, being very open and flexible and being able to listen as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, as an educator, trying to be spacious with students, but also in the way that we, we speak to people and, and, you know, that the, the way being open to what people are saying to us as well. And, um, I think that that really is going to help because it, it is like the UN was saying to really, for example, for climate change is going to take changes at kind of every level of society in every area of our life. I think mm. that's, I'm paraphrasing, but, mm -hmm. but it, it, it really wasn't honing in on one thing. It was like really taking a step back and questioning how we do everything, which is fascinating and difficult and challenging and confusing. Um, but it can be exciting too, you know, to really, it's like, oh, we can actually, like, we can actually get through this and come out the other side, like for the better, you know? Yes. Yeah. Love it. One, I don't know if oh, we're doing on time here, but um, in terms of just the environmentalists and the environmental movement, is there a big division within that movement um, between, because like, for example, on Cowspiracy, the documentary yeah. Cowspiracy, they would go to, I don't know, worldwide, I, I don't want to say names, but they would go yeah. to an environmental agency to ask what their opinion was on animal agriculture, and they would have like no comment. Right. What is that about? <laughs> I'm confused. Yeah, I think, I think Cowspiracy, I think, did a good job in some ways of, of showing that. I think that, I think that shifted quite a bit. You know, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, with, with films like Racing Extinction and the Game Changers from Luis de Hoyos. Like, I, I, think, I think there's been a bit of a tipping point with a lot of environmental organizations not feeling um, as afraid to talk about issues that I think maybe some of them were afraid about fun, you know, their fundraising campaigns. And, but I think mm -hmm. culturally there, there, there has been a shift and, and you just see it appearing in the media more and more um, articles about, you know, moving towards plant-based, plant-forward diets. Um, you know, there's probably some of the more conservative environmental groups that are, are holding fast, but my, my sense is, is that there's been, the center of gravity have sh has shifted a bit more that environmental groups uh, feel more comfortable bringing that into the narrative. So, and, you know, I think Cowspiracy helped because um, that film was done a number of years ago, but I think that has, has helped kind of move that need a little bit. And, um, um, cause I, I am seeing it more amongst environmental groups and just in the media in general. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 Documentaries are so impactful in that yeah. way. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Michael, for chatting this through with us. It looks like um, I'm certainly walking away with that we should re reflect upon what it is we do uh, day to day, but then how that fits into the overall way of life, right, in our respective countries and how we might actually go across the border and then hold hands uh -huh. and work through solutions together uh, so that we can improve our planet. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I so admire um, the work that uh, you're both doing um, in terms of running a micro sanctuary and the education work. Um, I just feel like that type of work is, is, is so sacred. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing and for running this series, which is again, um, so wonderful that you're doing that. And hopefully there'll be a lot of ripple effects in that. Thank you so Great. much. Okay. Hopefully you uh, you'll stay warm up there. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care and thank you okay. again. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. So that was a really really interesting interview of mm -hmm. Michael. Um, you know, I don't know, I think what would be a great place to start is what are our opinions about will eating plants actually save our planet? Elsa, James, who'd like yeah, to start? start ladies first. Yes, okay. <laughs> Elsa, why don't you go ahead? Um, that's a great that's a great question. Will eating plants alone, mm. if I added the word alone, right. save mm. our planet, yeah. I would probably say no. But will eating plants or does eating plants need to be part of saving the planet, I would say yes. Uh -huh. So I think that's how I would answer that question. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that a, uh, skirting the topic or or thinking that it's possible to save the planet by not flying, mm. um, carpooling, commuting by bicycle, um, all of these things. Mm. Uh, I think that just doing those things, maybe living cooperatively, insulating your home. I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many things you could do, but I think that leaving diet out of the equation and uh -huh. um, or even focusing on regenerative agriculture, for example, as like your solution to saving the planet um, and leaving leaving eating plants off of the list of mm -hmm. things needed to save the planet, I think would, would be insufficient. Uh -huh. um, so I think eating plants is necessary, but not sufficient. I right. Guess. That's yeah. So ultimately, we're trying to say it's not the silver bullet, right? Not but the it's obviously a huge part of helping, right, impact the planet. I mean, yeah. I think it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's necessary. Uh -huh. James. Yeah. Well, it's it's not just from a, an emissions point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Fresh water usage is predicted to run out in the not too distant future, and mm -hmm. animal agriculture uses mm -hmm. a huge portion of fresh fresh mm -hmm. water usage. Things like that. So um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same with health. It's not like just going, you know, plant based is going to fix your health if you're really stressed and you're uh -huh. not sleeping Touché, and yes. you know, don't not doing mm -hmm. any exercise. So it's it's, it's part of the uh, the solution, uh, not the entirety of the solution, mm -hmm. but it definitely. I mean, it's just we use so much land at mm -hmm. the moment for producing food, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which has resulted in so much land being cleared for it and biodiversity lost and all that, you know, species extinction, all these kinds of things. Uh, we need to rewild some of that land and, and we need to reduce the amount of land we're using for farming. Mm -hmm. And um, it's only inefficient to feed a huge amount of plants to an animal, which wastes a lot of energy in just, you know, functioning and growing and um, you know and then uh, you get a small amount out of the other end mm -hmm. uh, is it just total inefficiency when you can just go directly to the plants and eat you know far fewer plants than the animal needs to eat mm -hmm. um, so uh, mm -hmm. so you know this yeah yeah I think on a calorie basis it's something 80 to 90 percent of the calories and protein are lost when it's cycled through the animal uh -huh. so it's a vast uh -huh. I mean Some you mentioned it big. it's, a, it's yeah. a high it's a high percentage and it depends on the animal it and it does, depends yeah. on how they're raised yeah. right it depends on a few factors but we could just say north of three quarters mm -hmm. of the calories and protein are then lost mm -hmm. right with the waste the water and the, not just lost but then as you say um, also using like contaminating our clean water mm -hmm. contributing to the contribution of of, of our air pollution problem with all the methane mm -hmm. and then right the petrochemical fertilizers and the feed like that's there's just mm -hmm. so much right using the petroleum there's just so many ways beyond 
um, beyond just the land or, yeah. or, or just And I think that's it. why, right, everybody is saying, okay, now go vegan for, right, the environment, because right. that was one of the questions that I had asked, right, with Michael, like, okay, when we talk about the planet and going vegan, what does this have to do with the environment, you know? Mm. So it may not be the silver bullet, but I really feel like, right, it touches on so many different areas mm. that it makes that greater impact, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I understand how people will go, well, okay, it's not the only thing, but but honestly, it's a huge thing, right? So it really, really helps things along, I think, yeah. So speaking of helping things along, mm -hmm. what do we think will actually create change? Because, you know, in the discussion with Michael, we were talking about um, policy change, or is it a bit more around capitalism and financial backing, right, of mm -hmm. pushing something forward? I mean, granted, there there is a lot of social movement around this as well, but is that actually more from a kind of a funding standpoint or a policy standpoint, you know? How do we feel about that? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know, and maybe James has more something more intelligent to say. I, I watched the, I watched <laughs> the interview. I guess I think that um, I, I thought about. I, I studied nutrition in graduate school, and um, public health policy was one potential avenue. And I went more on the epidemiology side, so I know a lot more about sort of looking at studies over time, looking at populations over time on different diets, and um, what kind of chronic diseases arise and don't arise as a result. And so I can say a lot about that. And then the public health policy is super interesting, but just not an area that I know a lot about. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that uh, people will often wait until they have an economic advantage to make some sort of choice, um, possibly a health advantage, right? I hear people, you know, they end up going vegan because they've had a heart attack, right? So now it seems like that's the move that's pushing them, right, to, to, mm. do, to, to do something for their health. Um, and that's fine. And I think that similarly, people will often wait until it's economically advantageous to make some particular move, like mm -hmm. buy your next car and mm -hmm. maybe make it an mm -hmm. EV, maybe when EVs become cheaper, right? So people wait until, um, until it's economically feasible. And so I do think that, I do think that to the extent that policy, corporate, you know, the big corporations, also our government um, regulations and whatnot can make plant-based and sustainable food more affordable, I think that's mm -hmm. going to be essential to get a lot of people on board. I mean, I think that some people are going to be committed enough to the planet's welfare um, to just eat plant-based regardless of the cost and committed, but also entitled and, and, and privileged enough, right? So some people are going to have access to that and be committed enough to do that, but a lot of people are going to need the costs of meat and animal products to, to, to rise to what they really do cost, mm -hmm. like what it really costs to clean up the water, uh -huh. clean up the air, clean right. up the, the sludge, you know, from the sewage and whatnot, um, from the animal waste, like for that cost to come up a bit to what's really actually genuinely, um, like what it costs and for maybe the price of, uh, for the price of the plant-based products mm -hmm. to come down a little because the demand is higher and the supply is better and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I do think that a lot of people are going to need that. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that, I think that big companies like Tyson, Purdue, KFC have already seen that. And so they're like, Hey, I'm going to make vegan nuggets. Uh -huh. I'm going to make sure vegan chick, right? Because yes. I can make it I can make a price point that's more similar to the meat analog that people are already interested mm. in buying, and I can make some money on this. Right. And I think that that could make, they could, I think that companies getting in on um, bringing the costs a little more level between the plant-based and the, and the meat mm -hmm. options um, could, could help some people sure. you know, access that because it's a matter of access in a lot of cases. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think I'm, I'm uh, from my point of view, it was where I'm looking at it was, okay, if it's policy, then it's kind of this top down, you must right mm -hmm. kind of do right. Mm -hmm. And then with the, with a social change or, you know, money kind of change, it's like a bottom up kind of, mm -hmm. you know, thing, because I do find that now as people are thinking through how we can create this change, mm -hmm. whether it be either kind of strategy, mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of um, animal welfare organizations as well as vegans and, you know, others, food organizations, so forth that are starting to go, well, is this a strategy we can really start to push can we have people vote on this mm. to then push the farmers to change x y or z mm -hmm. or what have you you mm -hmm. know 
It's just, I feel, my opinion, is that that route is so slow, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you've, you've, got to, you've got to stop the governments pouring money into these industries. Right, right. Which yes. Which keeps the price down right. because they're being lobbied to do so. Right. But actually, when it comes to plant-based foods, I mean, to be to be plant based or vegan, you don't need to buy the Beyond Meats and all that mm -hmm. kind of Correct. stuff. The, the staple foods of rice, mm -hmm. beans, potatoes mm -hmm. are so cheap mm -hmm. um, that you know the staple foods are actually mm -hmm. really cheap. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I think I think you know a lot of it comes from educating people to make better choices, and they don't mm -hmm. actually have to spend more. And you're absolutely right about you know being there being an economic economic incentive for mm -hmm. certainly companies to make mm -hmm. changes. Sure, sure. And certainly people on an individual mm -hmm. level, but if they know that actually, you know, I mean, if everybody went sort of ninety ninety five percent plant based, like the whole mm -hmm. country, like the whole world, then that's like we we've almost saw you know that aspect we've almost solved it already. We don't need everyone to go mm -hmm. hundred percent vegan, but mm -hmm. if people were uh, open to having a, a more sort of you know uh, whole grains and beans and potato based which is basically what you know the the staples for plant-based mm -hmm. if they, they they base their diet around that that's yeah that's um yeah they, they don't they don't have to not gonna be paying any more for you know for their food so i think maybe a bit of education is uh Mm -hmm. or, you know the masses, but how do you, how do you get that out there mm -hmm. when you got the carnivore dieters uh, <laughs> promoting their regenerative farming or paleo uh, or yeah, what well, have you? Paleo, right? is, paleo is old school. No, oh, it's right. Yeah. Carnivore Sorry. diet yes, is the new. Carnivore is the new. Is the new one. It's right. Percent animal product. That <laughs> diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't know what. Yeah. Well, I, I think know. education runs into the. I do think it runs into, right? Who's doing the educating? Yes. Right. Because. Right. The dietary guidelines are handed down from the USDA, mm -hmm. and, and I think the U.S. is fairly unique. I don't know what it is in England, but the U.S. is sort of unique in having their Department of Agriculture have two purposes that are potentially, you know, in conflict okay. with one another, right? Mm -hmm. So promoting a market for agricultural products and providing nutrition education, right. right? I think a lot of countries have split those ministries into two arenas. A lot of, you know, Western countries sort of similar to ours, and so... I, I think that is really challenging, and I think that, mm -hmm. um, gosh, I don't, decades ago, uh, 50 maybe years ago, something, many decades ago, I believe the, a rendition of the dietary guidelines, you know, the, the dietary guidelines are put out by the USDA, but they consult with scientists and researchers and, you know, medical professionals to get with the research and, and the data to say, hey, what should we, what should we put out there? And you know, it was recommended, like I said, something like my lifetime ago, um, hey, we should really be telling people, like, let's eat less meat, let's eat. Mm -hmm. And um, and and then there's all sorts of, right, there's all sorts of conflicts of interest. You mentioned lobbying and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And and, um, and so I think the education piece is, is tricky with our particular setup, uh -huh. um, at least from the government, as you say, sort of from the top exactly. down. Right, yeah. And so... Yeah. But I wonder then, coming back to the environment a little bit and your financial piece that you mentioned, I wonder if the government could, you know, again, top down, but I wonder if there could be some, you know, instead of voluntary compliance with environmental regulations, some mandatory compliance with environmental regulations mm -hmm. for, right, for even fa for factory farms or for um, some other animal products that could make Again, financial incentives, right? If if the farmers are not able to afford, if they can't just sort of pass off these, pass on these costs to our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren to clean up the mess later, if they're actually forced to pay mm -hmm. at the time, maybe they have to change their practices. Maybe they need to mm -hmm. have fewer animals, you know, in that space. Mm -hmm. um, if they have to clean up the air and water right. that's associated with them, or if they have to pay, as you mentioned, subsidies, if they have to pay full cost for their oil, mm -hmm. full cost for their grain, full cost for their land, which I, I'm not sure they always do have to pay full cost right. for those things. And yeah. so if they are having to pay, then maybe that that, that sort of helps. Yeah, um, I think for farmers to survive, they have to take those subsidies. Su subsidies right. For, yeah, yeah, right. from government. So th pay. that's a way that I think we could you could mm. come in. Well, I think, right, a, a little while, not too long ago, um, California had that prop that they had on their election ballot about the space of an animal and what is allowable space. First of all, as a sanctuary now, right, right starter, founder, and, and running this sanctuary, to think that what they were 
just trying to lobby for that amount of space for an animal to live in and that that is an improvement of right. what is currently there <laughs> but i get like what you're going down that road right if we're now looking at later on costs and how can we now affect that policy wise now I understand that strategy, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to vote for it knowing that, you know, that kind of space for that animal is ab abhorrent. But mm -hmm. anyway, I do get it if we're now trying to break it down because it's now, what is the cost of all of this? Mm -hmm. Cost that it is now, but then the impact of that cost later on uh, when what? What resource will run out, right? Is it what, water first, air, clean air. I mean, what is it, right? You know, land, land. I mean, I mean, we're already messing up the soil completely, right? You know. I mean, I think James makes a good point that you know, eating plant based can can be really cheap. I mean, it can be uh -huh. as, it can be as cheap or even cheaper these days than than eating an animal based mm -hmm. um, diet. And and so I guess what I was saying is maybe let's talk about the animal products cost like more mm -hmm. more of the real cost than coming yes. to the so consumer right. and to the and to the companies producing mm -hmm. right <clears throat> rather yeah. than to the taxpayer right rather than mm -hmm. i mean oh, we are paying but mm -hmm. we're paying indirectly indirectly you know and yeah. so the consumer right. and the companies right. making these products are not are not necessarily seeing the cost and they're not necessarily paying the cost and mm -hmm. and so i think it's not so much about right bringing the cost of beyond meat sausages down or whatever like that's that could or could not happen, and I don't know that that's going to impact the health of the planet so much. But I do think that bringing the co the real cost to the companies and the consumers um, of those products directly, I think, could really mm -hmm. could really have some kind of yeah powerful. Massive. People would people right. would yeah would eat it far less regularly for stuff. Right, it could just be less frequent. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a great right. Well, start. I mean, right, meatless Mondays, right, it was like a must start to that, right? Indeed. <laughs> And maybe we can now make it Tuesday or Wednesday, right? <laughs> so. yeah, well, because sure. people have budgets. I mean, right? right. That's just, exactly. You're right. People have yeah. budgets. Yeah. It should, it should be more like Meaty Sunday <laughs> right. the rest of the week. Only, is, right? Yeah. Meaty Sunday only. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> right, right. If at all. Yeah. If at all. That's right. Yes. But, yeah. That's, that, I think, I mean, uh, at least, um, you know, speaking to my parents, they say that, you know, when they were really young, you know, People didn't eat meat every day, and mm -hmm. they certainly didn't eat it three times a day. Right. Uh, so you know, there's been a massive shift in that direction, but it has to has to come back because uh, mm -hmm. you know the the population's only growing, mm -hmm. and um, if people start to adopt, well, certainly developing countries are also be, as they become more uh, affluent, they're they're right. shifting to a more uh, Western uh, diet. Western diet, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. there isn't enough land to feed all these people. No, right. we, we have to, we have to, you know. Right, I think E.O. Wilson said, and this was, I was in college, I think it was 20 years ago, E.O. Mm. Wilson, you know, the famous environmentalist, he, he's an environmental scientist, and I think he said if everyone wanted to eat, and I don't believe he's a vegan necessarily, but he recognized even 20 years ago the importance of eating less meat and whatnot, he said if everyone, and he was actually just talking about the Western diet, which obviously is meat heavy and dairy heavy, and, and he said if everyone wanted to eat like, an American, we would need like eight planet Earths. Mm. You know, we just don't have eight planet Earths, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and again, that wasn't necessarily promoting, you know, veganism, but to be conscious of the land use, the water use, the, yes. the fossil fuel use, because you say population's growing, but our clean water mm -hmm. sources are not growing. If anything, they're shrinking, mm -hmm. right? And then, yeah. and then yeah. the yeah. arable yeah. land is certainly shrinking, right? Mm -hmm. Deforestation's only on yes. decline, right? And to say nothing about the warming. Yes, right. Absolutely. Um, so then, how it's a very bleak picture, isn't it? It I mean, is, right? I mean, well, and I do want to. I do want to have something positive, though. But yeah. that I don't know where you were going with that, yeah, because yeah. well, no, I mean, that, then I was going to say. Okay. okay, so now we're talking about all these. Okay. How can we really know the cost of these things? Who can we trust to actually find the cost of these things? Okay, such that we get right. Because I know Ella was asking about that. You go into certain, mm -hmm. you know, agencies. These documentaries go and start interviewing, mm -hmm. right, right. and they really just don't want to touch certain questions. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, do, do they really know the information? Mm -hmm. B, they don't want to be caught on camera saying the wrong thing, right? Sure, I mean, sure. there's a myriad of reasons, right? So how and what can, where at what point can we be real and be really responsible about it and who? What is because I get it. There's now a shift where the, all the countries in the world are saying, "Hey, we all have to right hold hands and do this together." So maybe through the UN or through this right, right. What was it the Paris Agreement and so forth? Right. There was I think there's attempts, but it's like 
it just feels as though these attempts are only attempts and that there isn't a whole lot of follow through. So right. where, who, what, you know, how will this actually, you know, because then it comes down to, okay, we're hoping that that's happening, but in the meantime, okay, you know what? I'm going to eat vegan. I'm going to recycle. I'm going to maybe plant my own stuff. I'm going to, you know, I mean, there's some things on the individual level you do, but we really do need this to be a collaborative effort globally. You know, mm -hmm. we really do. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know where and how and who can be trusted mm -hmm. <laughs> such that it is the real data or it is the real situation that will bring us all together. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some massive calamitous situation that then brings it all to a head, mm. you know. Well, and I'm sorry think, to be doomsday. No, no, it's but. fine. I think we're in the calamitous situation, actually. I just uh -huh. don't think we talk about it that often. But uh -huh. I think we're already there. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the coronavirus should have been an indication uh, that, uh, that more of those genetic diseases are going to be coming if we don't right. uh, change our ways. But I don't think anybody's taken that really uh -huh. on board. So. Right. So yeah. I, well, yeah. I think the I yeah. think the UN is a great place to start, start right? I think right. that I think that they're um, you know the 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 paper that. Uh, Michael referenced, I think, is is from the UN is worth considering the Paris Accord, of course, um, and and I do think that international cooperation on you know it's it's interesting because we have international cooperation on all sorts of other really critical pieces, right, that impact the whole world, and so I I don't see why we and and we have it around climate change, um, but maybe we just need to look at some of the con contributions to that. Uh, more specifically, right? So, uh, and I think that, I mean, I would trust the UN and I would trust organizations, um, particularly uh, what I was thinking about was those ministries in other, in other countries um, where, the, where they're promoting education, nutrition education, but also education about environmental preservation. And, and that ministry is also not then responsible for creating a market for agricultural products like uh, our USDA. Uh, so uh, I would, right. I personally feel good about other government agencies mm. that are mm. promoting um, environmental preservation, you know, and I don't have any reason to mistrust like our own environmental protection agency. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think that like to, to Ella's question about the environmental groups, mm -hmm. um, I generally try, you know, I try to trust information and investigate it until I have a reason not, not to. to. So yeah. I'm, I would consider them our allies. And um, I mean, we all want to drink clean water, right? <laughs> we all want to breathe clean air. And we mm -hmm. want that for our friends and our, our future generations, mm -hmm. right? As a parent of three. So I, um, I think we all want that. And it's just a matter of, um, right, how do we how do we get there? And I think, mm -hmm. I think a Consumers, you know, as individuals, like I've been commuting to work by bicycle for like 25 years, and that's just part of my my little piece. But mm -hmm. you know, I don't think that's gonna, alone going to save the planet, right? But I, I do want to take some personal responsibility for you know fossil fuel consumption, mm -hmm. um, right? And I have a you know an efficient heat pump and all of that. But honestly, cooperative living, like he talked about, family size and cooperative living, right? That's an essential piece. And I've digressed from your question about who to trust, <laughs> but I, but again, I this is, you know, there's. But I'm saying out, those are environmental, right? Um, uh, environmental like steps, I yeah. guess, steps that can be taken mm -hmm. to help save the planet in concert with, mm -hmm. um, you know, in concert with like government agencies' yes, uh, right. recommendations and my yeah. own personal choices. Yeah, it's so complex, isn't it? I mean, it literally it is, is but every I guess fabric I, of our life. I get, it is, but yeah. I guess I wanted to end on a, on a sort of a positive like like okay yes. the, you know it's great to look at the EPA and the UN and other ministries of agriculture and mm -hmm. and and environmental protection in other countries and and try and get people to cooperate but you know the only way you make change really is starting with yourself and then right. you work with your family or your right. friends yeah. right and then you work in your community and I think that that's often how um, I'm thinking about like smoking prevalence has come down, you know, it's maybe a third of what it was, half of what it was, you know, a few decades back. And that really happened a lot in the household, right? It happened within families uh -huh. to start. And, and there was, you know, eventually the medical association got mm, on board sure. and, and stopped recommending it to people and stopped smoking so much themselves. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that was a slow process, as you said, right? The yes. top down approach is very slow. And very slow. we do have power as individuals, right? right to make choices. Yeah, sure. So I just want to, I want to say like, you know, learning how to 
learning how to have information literacy is one of the things that I think we can do. Mm -hmm. So instead of me saying, well, I think we should trust this agency, yeah, and James right. says, well, I think we should trust this one in England, you know, like, yeah. I think we all should learn to the extent that we can how to read sources, look at their conflicts of interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. Right? Consider, yeah. consider the source mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, make the best choice that works for us as individuals. Mm -hmm. In knowing that knowing it could that, have a broader impact. Well, knowing well. that, yeah, we're all interconnected, like we right, need right. each other, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So do, I think do, that's what we're coming down to, right? I mean, do you have more to add on yeah. that? With the, Jeez, who do we trust and so deems, where do you go for your... <laughs> well, who do we trust? I mean, I, I'd like to think the International Panel on Climate Change would uh, be trustworthy, but when you look at these... Um, uh, these climate summits they don't talk at all about what we're eating that's right and so mm. you know the people who need mm. to be making the policy changes aren't you know um doing what they should be doing <laughs> and uh I, i'm not sure sometimes who to trust on uh, right in terms of on information yeah i would like to think the un and the IPCC are mm -hmm. uh, trustworthy they're definitely not saying go carnival no right, right. Uh, so you know, the carnival folk who pr promote um, this regenerative farming. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, yeah, it may help to have animals on the, f you know, as part of this uh, mini ecosystem, like but ecosystem. It, it doesn't sure. mean you have to kill them mm -hmm. and then replace them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just leave them there. Right, know? right. So right. You can eat your compost and yeah. be done with it, right? Yeah. clone them like most yeah. farms do, right? right? Or whatever, you know, yeah. Breed them. Yeah. Right, breed them so that, mm -hmm. yeah, right, so. Well, so that, that on a positive note, I was just thinking, okay, so the UN Council, maybe they're not they're not serving plant-based food necessarily. Right. Although I think there there have been some options in recent in recent <laughs> history. Uh, there were yeah. at least at least vegan options. Mm. But I was just I went to an environmental um, event three years ago, I think, just here. So coming back to the local, mm -hmm. um, put on by I think a uh, UVA, the University of Virginia environmental group, and it was a little art show, and all of the food was vegan ah. and I, wow. including vegan cheese ah. like pieces, like not just sort of hummus and veggies uh -huh. mm. and nice. had the standard veggie tray without the ranch dip. And I was sort of surprised. So I went to ask yes. the organizers and they said, Oh, well, you know, we're an environmental group and we know that saving the planet really requires that people eat a lot less meat and dairy and that people eat wow. as close to vegan as they're comfortable doing as often as possible. And I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> like, right. Wow. Can I hug you? It. Right. So I was like, this is great. Maybe can you work with like your, you know, the environmental <laughs> agencies moving up like regional <laughs> statewide and then moving up to the country. So I do think like uh -huh. some people, some environmentalists, definitely do get it uh -huh. um right and yeah. uh, i mean i consider myself an environmentalist you know people often know me as much for biking to work as as for being vegan right, <laughs> right um right. and so and that's been a thing for decades and um and so i think that some people are making that connection and it's just a matter of again like s starting in our communities and then working mm. working up you know sure. to um spread that message and really yeah. kind of as many, I think, you know, we should all be allies, right? Like, we're all sharing this planet. Right. And the environmental groups and the, you know, the sort of animal welfare groups and the even the people just promoting vegetarianism for health-based reasons, you know, the medical community, if you will, like, we should all be allies in that. Yeah. Ideally. And I'm, I'm certainly trying to do my part in that as, as a person who bridges those three worlds. Yeah. And we all have our, right, you have your worlds and you have yes. your worlds. And to the extent that we can make mm -hmm. allies... Um, with the other groups, I think, so that we're all working towards a common mm -hmm. goal. Great. So, you know, honestly, we'd love to hear from you all as well. We've been uh, chatting on uh, about this, and I think we've arrived at ourselves. Okay, there's a lot of individual work, and that individual work is meant to impact a bigger, right, greater global community. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can all reach out to our local and global communities to work together as well on, on some, you know, solutions and such. Uh, but what do you all think? I don't know. Do you think that there's a silver bullet? Do we really think that just eating plants is what will save the planet? You know, um, write, your, write in the comments. And by the way, we'll share all of the links as well. 
um, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And um, all that we can say here for sure for the three of us mm -hmm. is um, we've been vegan for a while and we absolutely feel that that contributes to the big picture um, and in a very large impactful way. So uh, if you need any suggestions in that kind of way as well, reach out to Hogs and Kisses. We'd be happy to point you in the right direction as well. Okay, we're all ears. We want to hear from you. Thanks for beating around the barn with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michael, for chatting with us, as well as having our local Charlottesville folks join us for the roundtable discussion. Uh, whether you're vegan and going, oh, yeah, I'm in it for the environment, too, that seals the deal. Or maybe you're on the edge and going, oh, wow, you know what? The environment conversation is what's having me now go vegan. We hope that you found the information valuable, uh, no matter what your heart is in, whether it's you know animals, the planet, uh, or your diet. Yep. Thanks for beating around the barn with us. Such great conversations. Um, oh no, mm -mm. no, I don't like that. What was I gonna say? Wow, thanks to all of. Um, no, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. again. Yep. Sorry. One yep. more. Yep. Thanks for beating around the barn with us. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs>